Um, effectively, I'm going to keep this very quick based on you've had meetings all day. Uh, so this is uh, the annual report that we provide to Council from the Kaiapu Food Forest. Um, as is usual, I always make at least one mistake in my report, and hopefully anybody that's read the report has found it. Have you found it yet? So, you, that, <laughs> on page three, it talks about how many visitors, visitors we get to the food virus via Google, and it's actually 10,000. So every month we get 10,000 visits on Google. Um, effectively, um, if you were to look at the food forest in relation to the amount of visitors that we get, not only online, but also physically through the food forest, uh, we get them from all over the world. Just as you've seen in the report, we get them from Japan. In one day, I had six international visitors from all over the, over the, over the world. It was just extraordinary. Um, the thing is that we've been going for three years now. Over 2,000 trees and plants have been donated by the local residents, and it just goes to show as to how the community have become involved in this project and how they want to become more involved in the project. The issue that we have currently at the moment is that we still do not have an updated license to occupy. Uh, we're still waiting for a response to that. Um, we would like to see at some stage a building on site and potentially a toilet as well, ideally a toilet. Um, it follows on in terms of the food forest report, it follows also on with regard to Tess's um, presentation later on in your meeting in regards to food secure communities and I believe that the food forest is going to be an element that the government would love to see more of and that is having more and more food forests around all of New Zealand and potentially all around the Waimakariri as well. Um, that's about it from me, thank you. If there's any questions. Thank you very much, Brent. It's, it's been absolutely brilliant to see the work that's been done there. Um, when you talk about like a toilet facility, have you investigated things like composting toilets, that side of things as well? Or were you thinking you wanted it connected into the reticulation? Thank you. That was one of the questions I would I had asked by one of the trustees today. So previously, the food forest was on site. There was nine previous residential sections on that one site. So potentially there may be existing um, sewer running past either on CAS, it would be on CAS, uh, so potentially there. But uh, we've seen in other places composting toilet alternatives which could potentially work on that site. We're not looking, in terms of a building, we're not wanting a large building. Uh, we're wanting effectively a building that could house small education programs like we had the first school come back to us today, that was Kaiapoi North. Um, and like we've got University of Canterbury coming tomorrow. Uh, so it's like when it's wet, we would like to have the opportunity that we could talk about the food forest and potentially be undercover at the same time. But to answer your question, both composting and or retic uh, connecting into the existing sewer system would be ideal. The talk one. Yep. Um, re renewing the lease, yes, we're working on that, and I apologise for the delay. That has gone to um, property, and we're chasing that up. The, the matter of the toilets of all descriptions is being is being discussed by staff. We'll get back to you within the, within the month with a with a decision on um, suitability and availability, and, and where we're going with that. So both those matters are are under control. I was going to ask a question um, regarding the pavilion or all the buildings that are going to be built for the um, for the uh, yeah. How far away are they from the? So, yeah. Thank you. Because I was just thinking that. Thank you. Um, I just wondered where we were getting to with the toilets. 
having discovered the cost of a toilet last evening at the Kaiapoi Tuahiwi Community Board, you know, 350000 or something if you want a new toilet, it seems pretty expensive. Assuming, well, if it went down that path, who would be paying for it? Um, I think that being a charitable trust, we have the opportunity to go out to the community and actually fundraise a lot of this and actually fund it ourselves. Um, so yeah, we potentially would, would do all that ourselves. So that would be including a toilet and a small educational facility. I simply just wanted to say, Brent, love your work. Keep up the awesome, awesome work. Good to see you. Good afternoon. Um, the public refuse bins policy has been around um, for probably about three years and it has gone around many iterations of the policy, starting out with um, a simple review of the original policy and then uh, considering whether it should be built into the public spaces policy as well. Um, it was put on the back burner while that was discussed and then it came back around last year saying that um, management team suggested that perhaps we look at uh, incorporating uh, recycling and uh, have another look at the charitable bins that were also um, seen to be a bit of an eyesore on the entrance to our town and um, in some uh, intersections. So we did that, we looked again at the policy and decided that um, after much consideration that we go back to first principles, go back to what it was originally, um, and it's about public rubbish bins outside shops in, in new areas as well as existing areas. And as part of the review, I went through every uh, service request that mentioned a rubbish bin for the last three years and uh, analysed whether this policy was actually going to assist us in making decisions around those service requests and discovered that on the whole, yes, it did. Um, the question of uh, public recycling is a much wider question uh, that in discussion with Kitty and her team is more about uh, how do we manage it, how do we get this public recycling done without contamination and of course that's quite a vexatious issue and, and a much wider issue than this um, somewhat more simple policy. Uh, so I give you the policy today and um, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you've got regarding the review um, and our recommendation that this policy is adopted um, at this stage. Lindley, policy drives what this council does and where it spends its money. Why wouldn't we consult on something that's had a high interest and has had many public submissions through the annual plan for years? Why wouldn't we do some sort of community consultation under community views that says not sought? The policies intended to guide us on where we put our rubbish bins and things like that um, in reviewing all the service requests and um, I can't actually recall in our customer satisfaction survey and things like that, that, that the, a, a lot of it's about, you know, why haven't we got recycling and things like that, but this policy is actually about where we put a rubbish bin and who pays for it, basically. Um, and we decided that it's, these are council policies to guide our work um, for green space in, the narrower vision of where we put a rubbish bin um, rather than that broader community vision of the service we're providing with um, waste generally. And there's going to be obviously some more work done with that when the sustainability strategy, that next tranche of that comes through, I think it's stage three 
um, talks to the community about that, that wider rubbish situation. Um, yeah, it's just on the recycling itself in terms of just uh, talking through that. One of the things that we need to do is actually establish how operationally that would work. Um, public recycling bins, to avoid them going to landfill, there's actually an intervention that's required there around contamination. Um, so we need to have a look at how that would actually work because that's more of an operational outcome than um, a pure policy decision to say that this is where we would put them. Um, there's quite a few other things that we'd need to consider there. But back to my question, community views, guiding the council, there's not even the community boards have not even had a chance to make any comment on this policy, is that correct? No, no, they haven't. Um, I think with the review that the plan was that the the draft was brought to you, it is still a draft policy, and the committee had the opportunity to make any comments about the draft policy. And if obviously if you want us to go out for public consultation, then we'll we'll look at that. Um, uh, we, we, uh, like Lindley said, we, we could absolutely go to the community boards and consult with the community boards and let them have a look at this. If we were going to look to do um, broader uh, recycling in our public areas, that, um, that's something which as a level of service is probably best discussed as part of a long-term plan um, and or through the sustainability policy, which I believe stage four is going to address um, a lot more of that um, community-based um, sustainability initiatives and so so we, we could we could do both we could take this as a more um, operational policy which is looking at where we put our refuse bins at the moment and who pays for those to the community boards for their consideration um, but then we could also look at our levels of service um, in time for the long-term plan and which we could consult on um, noting that we have done this before as part of previous long-term plans and provided information to the council um, in terms of both the capital cost of putting in the recycling bins, but then, uh, which was reasonably high, um, but more uh, the operational cost um, of uh, doubles basically for all of the bins that we have if we put in recycling bins. So we're happy to, to do that again and recost that and, and consult on that as part of the long term plan if that was um, what the committee would like us to do. Is the sticking point with regards to having recycling bins and, and parks and whatnot, the fact that the recyclables need to be washed out and they never can be if you're just throwing something away? Because that does make it quite challenging and difficult to actually include those in. It's, it's disappointing to see that, that public recycling goes to the tip, but whenever you look at, at the challenges that you know, you'd have to go through and hand sort and wash out every single item before it went anywhere. That does make it difficult. So unless we could couple them with a wash station, which is probably never going to happen, um, I can understand where your challenges are there. I am now. No, just, just very briefly, as mentioned, this is very much an operational uh, policy. There's a much wider discussion to, to be had with regard to recycling. Most of you are, um, are aware that the questions that are, are floating around at the moment, in particular around uh, cusp and uh, how that trial went and how that trial could be extended and by extension, how we in turn applied recycling into uh, in particular some of our busier uh, parks and reserves over the, the summer period um, and as mentioned that needs to feed into the long-term long plan and we need to have this conversation over the next six months 
as we go into the new year and the long-term plan and how much uh, councillors are prepared to commit uh, to the cost of, of recycling balanced against that long-term plan. Getting back to Lily's report, I see it's very much cooperation. I would welcome the stance that she has uh, taken. It's a very good common sense one. I remember a few years ago going to Victoria Park, having fish and chips with the, with the kids, went to try and find a rubbish bin to put the, the paper in. And one of the, uh, the city council had decided to remove all the, all the rubbish bin. Didn't mind, we took it home, but I wasted some time walking around the reserve looking for a rubbish bin. Uh, next to be there, but it no longer was. No, thank you. Um, um, I agree that this is uh, this public refuse bin policy is correct. Um, moving forward, we will seriously look at um, recycling and that. But just at the present time, and with uh, COVID nineteen and the extra costs associated with, it, I think we just need to take a little breather and and take a wee step back on and do this as and when we can afford to do so. Uh, look, I'm, I'm comfortable with the recommendation. I'd have been happy for it to have gone to the boards for to, to have had their opinion, and, and maybe they will as a consequence of that if they wish to, um, but I would have been equally happy for that, but I'm, I'm not going to die in the ditch over it. I really think it, it achieves the same thing um, Councillor Bryan has put, put forward there. I've, I've had an approach by um, Woody in school, and I'm going to see students on Friday, they would like to see dog litter bins in our park. So it's part of their, um, a, a particular policy that they've got. So I'm going to see them on Friday about their ideas around that. And my suggestion would be to them that we'll to, to work with them through the uh, to, uh, consultation process, through the LTP, if that's how they want to do that. So um, these, these students are in a, a stage where they an age where they would be able to progress that through next year. So they, that may well be a submission that comes um, um, to us on that. But uh, the, the matter around recycling bins, I note the comments that have been said. I, I <clears throat> get a lot of requests from people who would like to see an additional level of service, but I appreciate what Councillor Duty mentioned before that comes with a cost uh, in that space too. But I, um, I think, um, thanks Lindy for your work on this. And if the boards have any comments, I'd welcome seeing what they are and look forward to hearing what Woody and school have to say on, on in the space when I see them on Friday. Being on council means you have to represent the people that are out there that you're talking to. And the people in my demographic no longer see it acceptable to put recycling in a rubbish bin. Other councils around the country have got joint bin initiatives and we've been talking about this for years and years and why Makariri is actually lagging behind other areas. So I'm a bit concerned. I know there is a cost to recycling, I'm full aware of that, but what is the cost of not recycling? What is the cost of filling up our landfills? What is the cost to our future generations? So we have to consider that. COVID has come in and it may reassess all our priorities. I understand that. But this is actually really important. This is a fundamental issue. It's a policy. And if we have a policy, all our operations are guided by that policy. So I think it's really important that the community boards should have had a say in this. I think it's really important that we should test to see where their appetite is as to what they're prepared to spend versus what they're prepared to throw away. So I actually, on this one, you know, there are other councils doing this. So how do they do it? Um, do they have people after school cleaning out the recycling and sorting it? We don't know because we haven't got that information, but it's definitely worth investigating. That would actually create jobs. Who knows? I understand in a COVID environment, it's going to be difficult to add cost. However, I'll ask you again, what is the cost of not diverting waste? in our current environment. I'm just going to have a very quick reply, Mr Bye. Chair, if I, if I, if I may. No, nothing in this report prevents what Councillor Barnett has, has just advocated. So if the community wants that, if, if that demographic wants that, then that demographic can come here and tell us through the LTP uh, process. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this is, I guess, a long time coming, the Waimakari Public Arts Trust. Um, there's a, a lot of background in there. I won't go through the, the full background and I'll take that background as read. This report is looking to appoint um, five people and a single councillor to uh, be on the Waimakari Public Arts Trust. Um, councillor Wendy Doody and councillor Robbie Bryan and myself held interviews um, after a exp an expressions of interest process. Uh, and we had some, some really good high caliber people um, from our community who um, really saw the value in the Waimakari Public, Art, Public Arts Trust, wanted to be a part of that to progress public art in our district. Uh, we were very impressed with those that put their hands up and um, unfortunately there were some um, which we didn't feel could uh, were up to the standard of others, um, and therefore we've recommended the five that are on here now. The, the change which has been identified in the report um, to the actual trust deed is the reduction in number of council uh, councillor appointees to the group. Um, it was identified originally as two, and um, a discussion between councillor Doody and councillor Bryan and myself, um, it was recommended that we reduce that to one. The reasons identified uh, in the report um, and are specifically around reducing the elected member influence on public art. Um, it's meant to be an independent uh, group of people who are making independent decisions on art in public places. Um, and then also giving the trust the opportunity to employ a further member in the future if they wish to do so, being that we're recommending five. Um, they are, are only allowed seven with one um, councillor, that would mean six, and they would have the ability to bring someone else on in the future if they saw fit. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, we need to appoint a count. On page 47, um, second point down, I think there may be a typo. It says a further member over time, noting that the trust can employ up to five trustees. I think that possibly is meant to be seven. Yeah. Uh, yeah, verbally right, yeah. written, written wrong. I, um, I'd like to put my name forward under H as the councillor appointed. Does anyone else want to challenge for that position? I'll second that. Well, how about I move it, Mr Chair, then it removes the... Um, no, I'm quite happy if anyone else wants, wants it badly. Um, I was going to move on at Wendy, but the expression of interest. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I belong already to the Waimakariri, what are we called? Art Collection that collection trust, and I've checked with the staff to make sure there wasn't a conflict of interest and they've agreed there isn't, uh, and there's sort of an overlap. Um, one will feed off the other a little bit, so I'm, I'm um, and that is a particular interest of mine, so I'm pretty happy um, accepting that position. No. Um, hey, look, um, look, I'm comfortable with the recommendation that's there. Look, all the individuals that are listed there uh, have, uh, look, I know a number of them, Jackie Wilson and Nicole, they, and Judith, of course, I'm not quite aware of Dale Foy, but, but all of them bring real skills uh, in the space and knowledge and passion of art. So it's well overdue, this trust um, and having this est established. There's a number of proposals that have been sort of waiting for the establishment of this to, to proceed. Uh, someone I, I know is wants to put a mural in the um, Conway Lane, for instance, so it would require this body in which to consider the appropriateness of this. So I know Councillor Duty's had a lot to do with the original establishment of this, and well done to, to her and uh, Councillor Bryan for their work as they've gone through. It's great to see that there's such an interest around among colleagues for the arts. The arts is something that's really important in this district. But I, I do know um, 
can't sit like he has a lot of interest in there and I think it's a good dovetailing with uh, his work with the Art Collection Trust. So um, that's why I was prepared to support him. Just very uh, quickly, just to recognise uh, the efforts of Mr. Brown and Julie Tyler as well. Uh, putting th This was a comprehensive process to get here today and uh, well done to council staff. Thank you. Yes, I, I would just like to concur with that. Um, really appreciate the work that Chris and um, Robbie and myself, that we, the work we did to, to go through and check these groups. It was quite a big big selection and very high calibre. And uh, to, to get down to this group that we've appointed, it's, it's a really good starting point for our um, Waimaka Public Arts Trust trustees. It's, it's fabulous and absolutely thrilled with, with, with what, it's, what it's doing, what it will be doing. And I've got one in Oxford that, that desperately needs to be looked at. Just asked the month, a year ago if we would like to this is gifted to put it in. We haven't been able to do anything about it. So, yeah, thank you. I um, just, just wanted to also um, commend this report and I just want to take my hat off to the caliber of the people that have come forward. Um, and you can see their passion in the applications that they put through. And I mean, we are so fortunate to have people with so much ability and um, background in, in the arts that, that are coming forward to do this for our district. Um, I didn't put my hand up for this because I, I just don't feel worthy looking at such an amazing field. And I know that there are others that, that have a much stronger background in that area. But um, I think this is, this is going to go on to do great things. And um, yes, thank you for all the work that's gone in behind it. Um, maybe Grant wants to come to the table and we'll sort of t might be better to have Grant there. I can start presenting the report, but there might be some questions Grant can answer. It's been a bit of a joint process between Grant and Ida to get to this stage. While my name's on the report, um, it doesn't necessarily mean I was responsible for fully writing it. Um, so uh, the... North Canterbury Minibus Trust. I don't need, think I need to go into the details around what they do. I think uh, councillors are aware of what the North Canterbury Minibus Trust does and their importance for our community. Um, we have been, uh, they came to us a number of years ago asking uh, for a location to be able to build um, a cover for their um, various vehicles and then also a little small space for um, them to be able to meet. Um, we, uh, at the moment, you'll, um, know that they're on Blake Street and uh, their tenure there is uh, not likely to be long-term based on the potential for development of that site in the future. Uh, we uh, have been through a, a long process. It's always very difficult um, to try and find suitable land for people. Um, land also uh, always has an opportunity cost involved in putting someone or something on that land. There's Reserves Act to consider. There's the needs and wants of the minibus trust um, themselves. Um, and so uh, the best way we thought to do that was to um, create a, a matrix of, um, a weighted matrix, and you'll see the weighted matrix uh, attached. And um, the results of that weighted matrix is a, uh, um, a winner, which is the small piece of land, um, 211 Marsh uh, Road, which is next to the water unit. Um, we've had, um, there were a number of, of pieces of land which were identified through both the um, the, uh, which made the matrix and then some which we put on the matrix but didn't actually take through to the report as be getting fully evaluated because they had reasons why um, they basically couldn't go any further. Um, so those are identified in the matrix as well. Uh, the North Canterbury Minibus Trust um, gave us their requirements for different pieces of land and they're happy with the size of this piece of land and the location of this piece of land um, right down to the fact that they... Um, gas their vehicles at BP, and this is closer to um, BP than some of the other pieces of land. So it was quite detailed, their requirements and what they wanted. They are requesting a 20-year lease. 
um, that's going to give them the longevity they need to be able to invest the sort of money they want to invest to actually get the facilities they want to get. Um, we think this is uh, the best outcome um, that we've been able to achieve throughout this process. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, <clears throat> sorry, Ian, it's me. <clears throat> Thanks, Grant and Chris, for the report. Just on the location at Marsh Road, is there any issues with this particular site with potential future bypass of the town of Ringura? Uh, so we spoke to the roading department about that and they provided us some maps which identified that uh, this piece of land is slightly um, to the south of where the bypass would go through um, and it would leave that piece of land um, alone essentially um, and the bypass route is relatively wide in terms of the um, uh, land that they would need for that bypass identified on the map. So we um, consulted with Joanne McBride around that and they were happy um, that this location um, would be suitable um, for the 20 year lease term. Just to say thank you to Grant and Chris for the work that's been done. This has been over a number of years. I've, I've certainly been involved in um, some of the questions that have come via uh, myself over the years working with Greg Wright and, uh, and others. <clears throat> They've been trying to find a solution of a, a, a land site for that period of time. And it's needed because their vans are, and vehicles are deteriorating, sitting outside. They're, they're going to have a lot of work to do to, to, to fundraise to get the building uh, actually built. But I know that they're looking to partner with the likes of Rotary, for instance, which is another organisation that's requiring storage for books um, uh, to for the book sale that they do annually because the location they've presently got is... is um, <coughs> got some challenges. So um, I think this is a really good outcome. It's a fantastic organisation, the Minibus Trust, that does a lot to help um, uh, vulnerable people in our community get to appointments. So, um, oh, okay. What's that, Chris? Um, the recommendation would be um, to send licence to occupy and actually be better at this. So it's um, <coughs> a statement that would be better at It's okay, as, as mover, I'm happy to uh, acquiesce to that. <laughs> so it's a lease rather than a, than a license to occupy. <clears throat> it, it, um, and I'm comfortable with the um, term that's uh, mentioned as well. For any organisation that's looking for funding, if they don't have a term of that sort, that they're going to find it difficult to achieve funding. So, and then to, to, to build uh, on. So look, I just think a really good outcome. Thank you to the staff for the work that they've done to get this open line. I agree to that. Very commendable outcome. Thank you guys. Any other speakers? Okay, I'll put the recommendation there. All those in favour say aye. Against, carried. Thank you. <coughs> Matt, Matt is aquatic. Uh, thank you. So the purpose of this report is to update the Community and Recreation Committee on uh, our activities and year-to-date progress. Uh, as I'm sure you appreciate, COVID-19 had a significant impact uh, across our customers, staff and facilities. Uh, this report, which I'll take as read, highlights these impacts, but also identifies the opportunities that this situation created, um, both to complete maintenance works and for aquatic staff to support the council and its vulnerable community members. Further, it touches on the financial impacts of this unprecedented event. We had promising numbers in our Learn to Swim Level 2 program, which started again recently, and currently taking bookings for Level uh, Term 3 full return to Learn to Swim. Uh, Acrobic started back this week with a class this morning having 30 participants, which is um, right up there with our busiest days. So it's good to see us back at normal levels. Um, finally, as approved in the annual plan, July 1 will see a small fees and charges increase coming into effect. We do appreciate that. The, due to the current economic environment, this change is unlikely to be well received. So we continue to work with Council's communication and engagement team to 
communicate the reasons for this change and continue to ensure that there's an equitable balance between user pays and rates funding. I am happy to take any questions. Thank you, Matt. Um, I can make it a question. Would you please thank your staff from this committee for the, for the excellent work they did during lockdown and their various ramifications throughout the society? It was much, much appreciated by the council. Any other questions for Matt? I just wondered, Matt, on page 74, um, the Dudley Park figures appear to be uh, down more than the Kaiapoi pool. Would there be any reason for that? Just looking at a proportion. In attendance, yes, that table you've got under 4.1. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't follow. The, the numbers are actually higher. Am I? Sorry, I was reading it that under Kaiapoi, the May 20 numbers were 621 compared with 7,000 odd the previous year. So that's, that's a reduction of about 12, uh, 12 times, where Dudley Park your May 19 figure was 17,000, and that's dropped right back to 1,044, which seemed to me to be a higher drop. Sorry, I, f I follow now. Uh, that's because of the learn to swim effect. Essentially, we have a lot more learn to swim through at Dudley Park. Uh, we, it is a bigger facility, as you know, so we have the greater capacity to get uh, more people through those programs and uh, schools programs and all of those sorts of activities. So of course, when they drop away, it's a, a greater impact as well. Great, great report overall. Um, I just had a question on 6.1. You've got um, depreciation as being greater year to date actual than budgeted. How is it that the depreciation is more over um, lockdown than forecast? Uh, I don't believe it's more over lockdown than forecast. Um, I checked that one with finance because I had the same question. Uh, in 6.1.5, as it says, the variation in depreciation results from evaluation of land and buildings which occurred after the annual pl plan budget was finalised, which is the wording they gave me. So, no, no, that's all right. Not to, yeah. Thank you very much for your report. It's very good. I'm sorry I haven't as yet managed to get into your establishment. But I will say the, the comments coming back that now that that pool is open, is just overwhelming. The, the, the adults that were desperately wanting to start to do their, their laps and also the ones that are doing the aerobics, I actually met a group of them by sheer accident and just to cross over in the having copies afterwards and they were absolutely just so thrilled to be part of it again so thank you I uh, just concur with the comments of uh, Councillor Duty and also Councillor Blackie at the start just the um, way in which your staff have um, certainly been happy to be redeployed at various locations uh, they were somewhere even here in the council building to uh, went down to the um, transfer station and there were staff down there directing people in the recycling sort of area to, to the supermarkets. Um, they did a, they've done a fantastic job and, and have clearly been very understanding through a difficult period of time. Um, Matt, really pleased that the maintenance has been um, undertaken through that period and I, I'm pleased that the manager's office in particular is has been um, now a manager's office. Because uh, when we went for that tour around, I was quite surprised the conditions that you were working under. But it's given the chance for a bit of a, a spruce up, and uh, which was which was needed. So it's an ideal opportunity. So look, thank you for what you've been doing, and all your staff. Uh, I'm I'm pleased that we're up and running again, and people can use our facilities. But very good report, um, and uh, look forward to further reports of progress through the year. Thanks, Matt. 
Matt, I just wanted to take the opportunity to say that um, I really commend you and your staff and thank you for going the extra mile and going out and helping our community whenever you couldn't be in that pool. And I really also would like to tip my hat um, for the fact that you guys have managed to um, make lemonade out of those lemons that you handed and, and, and managed to, to squeeze in some, some maintenance and, and um, some <clears throat> renovations of a certain office. And, uh, you know, I just think that was an excellent use of, of time. And um, yeah, well done, so thank you. No, because I've got to hang around for a while. Um, you met um, that very much appreciate the level of effort that you and your staff have put on, and like the other ones I've said, and we really would like that to be passed on. Thank you. And I can't wait to see your new office. <laughs> Kia ora koutou. it's nice to be back. Um, purpose of my report is to provide you all Community and Recreation Committee with an update on the usage and statistics of our district library services. It was a large report, apologies um, for that. Um, I'll take it as largely read, um, and if we have time, can I draw your attention to just a couple of points? Thanks. So, uh, given so much of the report was dominated by COVID. I thought I'd uh, draw your attention to 4.2. Uh, stories, not statistics. Capturing stories, feedback form. And on um, dotted around the desks, you'll have a piece of paper with a series of heads on it. Um, that's the form that I'm referring to. Um, so it, it seems like a long time ago when I last reported to you in February, and we had just finished our first ever full staff hui at Ruatanefa Kaipui. One of the outcomes from that meeting is 4.2.2, the capturing stories form. Now, traditionally, library KPIs and traditional quantitative data gathering supply you with statistics that count, measure, and record library transactions and KPIs, the number of loans, the number of visitors, and the number of website hits. But the qualitative data and the stories that these forms will gather and what stories they'll tell will give the missing bit that, that will give you the data, give you the stories that the data will miss. And they're going to encourage us as libraries team, the whole team, to think about and report on the who, the why, and the what. I'll refer you, refer you to 4.2.5, the story of a young man and regular user at Ruatanefa Kaiapoi who shared that the library had been essential at getting his small business off the ground and how super grateful he was. He was printing off his end of job summary and receipt for his first construction job and posters, small posters to advertise his business. Now in quantitative data, ring, data gathering, he would have been one transaction on a door count, one visitor and potentially one APNK one of the free computer um, uses. Now we are able to tell his story and share the value that the space and the services and the staff have made to him and the community. And by involving our customer facing staff in recognizing and then capturing the community stories of how and why they use the library, we'll be able to report on the difference that our libraries, our district library services are making while still continuing to report on the traditional KPIs. And then I'd like to refer you to 4.9, alert level two and libraries reopen for business. No report would be complete without COVID piece. So the shift to alert level two on May the 14th saw 30 of the 32 permanent library staff back on site at one of the libraries. We had two exceptions to age and compromised immune systems and they were working from home. 
in preparation for level two compliance, which was rigorous, um, and quarantining, returning, processing, and shelving the nearly 7,000 books that came through the slot in four days, my team were flat out. Some of them worked through the weekends and we opened on Monday the 18th. And then in those subsequent four days, we saw a 37% increase in loans, close to 7,500 compared with the same period last year. And unsurprisingly, 70% increase in the number of returned items. We had close to 10,000 books come through the door or through the return slot in four days. In 4.9.6, I referred to the library and information sector collaboration um, through Zoom, um, through the Library Association Lianza and Public Libraries New Zealand. I'd like to recognise that Waimakariri Libraries was one of a very small handful of libraries offering my book bag and click and collect at alert level three. And that our process that was rigorously checked by Waimakariri Health and Safety, pushed up to CDHB, pushed up to the Chief Medical Officer. That proposal has been shared with over a dozen councils for release as an alert level two service and some have written asking for permission to copy it as a business as usual service at, alert, at, at no alert level. The library's team focus and lockdown once the libraries opened was on being of service and meeting the needs and expectations of the community. My team offered 123 virtual programs from their own homes, curated 500 book bags, did home deliveries in their own car, direct to your device ebook resource services, hosted book bubble book groups with an age range from three to 92, plus all the behind scenes mentioned in the report. And when our doors opened on May the 18th, not one person balked or pushed back on the challenge of our commitment to open with close to full business as usual library services when other councils around New Zealand were not opening library doors to the community until alert level one or opened with click and collect only and no public internet, no public Wi-Fi, newspapers, magazines, and in some case, seats. I wanted to draw your attention to the dedication, care, empathy, and kindness that the library's team showed our district virtually and in person and are continuing to do since lockdown. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. And I'm sure the committee will join me in thanking and congratulating you and your team uh, for excellent performance over the last few months. Please convey that to all members of your, of your team. Questions, anyone? Pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Give yourself a big pat on the back. <laughs> Phil. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Paula, I'd like to uh, congratulate you and your team uh, for what you've done over the lockdown period in particular. Um, I'm not a great library user myself, but my grandchildren uh, avail themselves of your services and also collected uh, my book bag, which was a bit like getting a lucky dip, I understand. They're very excited about that. They're aged uh, five and eight. I also uh, came upon your online story time, and I'm still getting messages from Amy that I should listen to her reading, but I haven't actually done so yet. But um, I've also passed that on to my daughter in Queenstown, who's got three little to toddlers, uh, because it seemed to me that it's not just restricted to users within this area. So um, you are traveling far and wide with your uh, products. The other thing I'd like to say is I have actually downloaded your WiMAC, uh, WiMAC Rary Library app I haven't done anything with it yet, I'll confess, but I do have it downloaded. And uh, that's something you didn't mention today, that uh, is that getting publicised? Um, I hadn't come across it previously. So anyhow, I, I'm very pleased to move the recommendation and like others have said before, if you'd pass our thanks on to your staff, they've been very flexible. And um, Councillor Doody and myself deal with one of your staff members in creative communities, and uh, she's also doing very well. We're very pleased with her. So thank you very much. 
Thank you, Paula. This is, I just love this. And I just think that's, um, to have your libraries up with your hairdresser, that's really well up the scale, isn't it? <laughs> so well done to you and your staff. And, and thank you very much for this very good report. Thank you. Yep. Paula, I just want to say I love your reports. I love I love it when they come into, into my email box and I love it when you come and tell us these stories because you always walk away feeling good. You and your team have such a passion for people and, and the fact that you have actually bothered to, to change numbers and data into human stories. I mean, that in itself speaks volumes for you and your team. And I love what you guys have done under, under quite a lot of pressure, under lockdown, from, from home, from your own cars. I mean, it, and you not only pulled it off, but you did it so well that all around the country, they wanna know what you did and how you did it. That is just phenomenal. And um, also I, I too was um, tuned in and still getting notifications about story times, which I loved. And also I I'm, I'm can't say that I've, picked up a lot of Samoan yet, but I had tuned into that too. So um, you guys just absolutely punch above your weight. And I, again, tip my hat to you. Thank you. Just briefly, just to say I concur with the comments made by colleagues. Um, Paul, you know what I think about you and your team. I, I come over regularly and pass on my congratulations to you. I think you guys do awesome work. Uh, and through this period, you've been recognised through our community for that. And we, we had a meeting with a, a tricky client last week, and I was just amazed how you turned that round from someone who just did not want to go online at all, didn't want a bar of it when he came in, to the fact that he was quite open to that conversation at the end. Um, and it was a certain generation of age. Um, and, and, and that's the challenge that you probably face every day there, but the way that you handle that situation, I was really impressed with. But like others, pass on our thanks uh, to you and your team for the way in which you've managed that period. It was really tricky on that Sunday as we were coming into lockdown. The amount of people, the amount of books going out the door, um, but you guys handled it so well. And then the volunteers working in behind as well that have helped clean the books as they've come back. And it's been just a, a combined effort to make sure that our community has been well served so and looked after through that period. So thank you, really thank you. Well, I'm actually very pleased you're back <laughs> up and running again because of we our brother-in-law that had just had radiation treatment and um, and then it was a lockdown and he's such an avid reader but he will only read factual stuff so man we had to go right through all our library and pull out as much stuff as we could possibly have, give him the book load and off he'd go down then he'd be back the next week because he'd done that and looking for more so I'm very pleased that he go back into your library now because <laughs> he's done ours and Uh, not, not really. I think it's all been said. We're very proud of the library service and uh, and our other departments, um, the swimming pool, and also we've had friends with the food forest. So we've had a good afternoon, and I think you guys have all done extremely well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do have a few slides. Um, so my report gives an overview of the civil defence welfare response. That, um, and I'm aware that you have already had a presentation um, partway through that response. So the report gives a summary of what came through the dashboard and identified some needs that were addressed by the team over the event. Um, it also includes an overview of emerging issues. So I feel like the doom and gloom reports I'm gonna to attempt to not be the doom and gloom report today. Um, but particularly, um, it gives you a summary of the work that's being done, uh, supported by the community team um, through the community, 
so far and anticipating how we might address some of the needs, issues and opportunities that come, have come up over the COVID event. And you will see attached to the report um, a, a copy of the second iteration results from the community and social sector report, which was undertaken via social services Waimakariri and conducted in response to some planning that the community team did just prior to the lockdown, anticipating that we would need to gather good information from the community about the issues that they were seeing in the sector uh, that they were seeing in the community. So um, that report is now in its third iteration. It's being circulated again, and the plan is to regularly circulate that report across the community so that we can get a feel as to how um, the response is going, uh, what the impact of the economic downturn might be, uh, what the impact might be on the mental health of our community. So I'll be giving you a, a regular update um, snapshot of that. Um, what I want to concentrate on today is, is the community's response and really um, a strengths-based approach to that. So um, the first slide um, is to uh, just give you a heads up that the University of Auckland on Friday this, um, produced this hot off the press report, um, protecting and promoting mental well-being beyond COVID-19. And the, the URL that I've got there, I won't play that in the interest of time, but um, there was an interview on Breakfast Television on Friday. Uh, which highlighted um, the real impact that the COVID event is going to have on people who aren't used to being in a state of deprivation, who aren't used to not coping, who aren't used to the social sector, and are probably going to be a little bit lost at sea compared to the, the usually vulnerable um, so I, I'll circulate that with my bullet points this week and, and you may be interested in having a look. I'll also circulate the link to the report. But um, if we can just perhaps speed through, I've, I've only got a few slides. Um, so the report and the associated um, article are a little bit doom and gloom. And um, I think in terms of the community's response, we, want, we really need to be strengths-based. We really need to um, acknowledge the stressors that people are experiencing, um, to encourage them to provide the supports that are necessary, point them to the information that they need to get help, um, point them to the supports that there are, and, um, oh, sipping through. <laughs> and um, we want to be about strengths and taking people from, from a Point of real darkness into hope and possibility. Um, I might use this, shall I? Oh, okay, thanks. Um, I was talking to our new community development person today and we were talking about um, that while we want to encourage people, we really want to empower them as well. And I thought about that. I think this is Aunt B from the Andy Griffiths show, which some of you might be old enough to remember. Um, but I was, I was kind of thinking about. So, so for me, those, you know, a really formative thing was those great aunts who'd been through the war and they'd been through the depression, and they were the people who, um, if people were in a situation of hardship. They made the casserole and they made the baking and they went around and they, they were a shoulder to cry on. But they were the but they had um, some answers, they empowered people. Um, they had that real onward and upward philosophy. And I've seen a bit of that in our community over the last wee while and um, have been really proud of the community response. Um, um, I quite like this quote, a community is the mental and spiritual condition of knowing that the place is shared and that people who share the place define and limit the possibilities of each other's lives. It is the knowledge that people have of each other, their concern for each other, their trust in each other, the freedom with which they come 
and go among themselves. And why I like that quote is I think that this is a community that really seeks to know its people. I think um, it, it's really easy to get help for someone in this community. And a lot of the vulnerable people that we have come across in the uh, COVID-19 response, um, someone's known them or someone's known who they can link them up with. And um, I think that's a real strength of the community that we live in. So, um, oh golly, that didn't translate very well into this system. Um, the report that you have in front of you details um, the work that's being um, considered and carried out over recent weeks. And um, I was thinking about where it fits and I thought of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is pretty ubiquitous and everybody has heard of it. Um, I crossed out the word needs because I think we need to think of opportunities. And um, in each of the uh, needs, issues and priorities that are detailed into the report fits in line with one of those Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So if we talk about uh, food security and, and um, Brent gave a very um, interesting and informative presentation about food forests, food security is something that's been identified throughout the COVID event. Um, we can't have food banks running at capacity or beyond capacity forever. Um, if we're to create a real sense of community, we need to look at food more broadly. How do we get people growing food? How do we get people sharing surplus? How do we teach people to cook with inexpensive cuts of meat and, and donated produce? How do we create a, a food community? Um, we, th the opportunity has been identified to increase the amount of skill and resource sharing. So, so trading, um, things like time banking, um, beefing up the capacity of the likes of time banks and some of the um, community education, like the, the skill sharing that's associated with the time bank program, making sure that people have good access to information. And that means that you're gonna fill those basic needs of people for, feed, for food, for shelter, um, to have their material and physical needs met. The next one is safety. And it has been identified that there is likely to be an increase in mental health, uh, family violence, and dependency on substances. And we're already seeing that. We're seeing a significant increase in the number of people seeking support for mental health issues. Uh, police report that family violence has increased and that they're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Um, so we need to make sure that people um, know how to have safe, healthy relationships that they know how to um, live according to um, a healthy uh, mental state of mind. We need to empower people with skills and information so that their well-being is supported. Um, if we think about a sense of belonging, uh, you'll see that we have identified that people who are newly affected through a loss of employment or a change of financial circumstances may not have ac the same access to opportunities that they used to. So looking at how we can provide um, supports or funds, um, talking to the likes of Rotary about how we can get people to still be able to access the opportunities that they have in the past. Inclusion, a sense of belonging, is also about making sure that you fit into the society that's evolving. And it was really evident throughout the COVID event that digital isolation was a really big thing for a lot of our older people. They couldn't easily pick up information. They couldn't easily connect with people. They couldn't easily get access to the food and the services and things that they needed. Um, social isolation is another huge issue and that takes many forms that can take the that takes the form of um, you have a mental health issue you lock yourself away nobody makes contact with you you're an older person you don't fit so inclusion is a really big issue and I've included cultural inclusion in there and that fits under that sense of belonging um, self-esteem likewise all of those things fit under esteem as well but um, there is a real opportunity to um, 
to connect people into volunteering, to ensure that they have meaningful ways of reframing their sense of self while they are in a situation of albeit temporary unemployment. Um, and that's been discussed in, in various forums. And of course, um, opportunities for re-education, for re-employment. So um, I just thought it was really interesting to, to use that illustration because if you are fulfilling all of Maslow's hierarchy of needs in your community, you have strong community. And it's good to see that the, the initiatives that the community are coming up with align quite well with it. Happy to take any questions related to my report. Thanks. Thank you very much for that very measured and balanced dissertation. Um, I'm sure we're all on board with the, um, the potential for things to get worse before they get better. We're very aware of that. We also have great trust in you and your umbrella of overarching organisations to pull it all together and coordinate the whole thing for our people. So thank you very much for your efforts. Questions? Thanks. Thanks, Mr Chair. Just uh, thank you, Tessa, um, for your presentation. Just interested in the, currently what the level of demand is and need in terms of the food banks. Um, I'm hearing mixed things, so I'd just like to know what you are aware of. Thank you. I think the big thing with food banks is, is um, that food banks are a, a wee bit of a tip of the iceberg thing in this community as well, because we um, originally had four or five key food banks in the district, and at the moment, um, we, the food and budgeting group are doing a mapping across the district because a lot of people have just um, established new food banks. So we're dist discovering new food banks all the time. Some of the food banks have had relatively steady demand. And I think that that's because they have their sort of regular clientele. So Salvation Army would be a really good example of that. Their demand hasn't exponentially increased as you know it, um, but some of the more sort of community-based food banks like Oxford Community Trust have seen a significant increase. Kaiapoi Community Support have told us they've had an un, they've had a 150% increase. Um, and Hope Trust have had a really significant increase as well. So I guess it depends where they're getting their clients from and if they have a social service element to what they're doing and they're linked into a sort of cohesive community, um, the increase that they're seeing is, is greater. Um, Tessa, just interested in um, what you know of any government support for the food banks and for wins for the newly unemployed. Are you able to tell us a bit more about that? Um, yes, I am, but in very general terms. So uh, there is currently a fund through Ministry of Social Development, um, and that is specifically for support to resource food banks and the food bank collaborative that we've established over COVID have just put an application into that fund. Now that fund is designed to um, also be about empowering food banks. So it's got to be sustainable. So the, the food surety or food security programs that we are discussing are going to be a part of that fund. Um, 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 uh, yes. There's, there's good support for employment. I'm not the person to give you detail on that. I do have, I do have that information, but to, to give it in this context is probably, I'm gonna give you dodgy information. So, um, but what I can do is send you a summary from uh, Work and Income. So Tina Robinson sent me some detailed information of, um, and probably some links, because that, that's kind of evolving a little as well, so. Our second question is, um, 
we've, we saw the drop in volunteering when vulnerable people had to stay home and has there still been ongoing issues with volunteering dropping given that most of our volunteers tend to be a little bit older? Um, there has been something of a drop off in some of the food banks. I think people have, some of the older volunteers have decided not to come back partly because they feel vulnerable. Some of them have decided to get on with their lives and they've been volunteering for a long time. Um, that's something that they're considering. Um, and I know I've had some conversations with Student Volunteer Army about how they might plug some gaps ultimately, but at the moment they're coping quite well. And I think the collaboration's helping a little bit with that. Thank you, Tessa, for that awesome report. Um, I have been privileged to sit in your welfare committee meetings throughout all of this, and it has never ceased to amaze me that the comprehensive team of people that you've pulled together to wrap around our community and the care and empathy and compassion that they have for the people that they serve. And I know you guys have run yourself ragged and you know, this is this is a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> um, but I just want to say I um, really appreciate the work that you're doing. And again, would like to continue to be able to help in any way that I can. And I just really would like you to pass on to everybody just how appreciative we are of everything you do for our community. Thanks. Yes, thanks very much, Tessa. Your network of um, community organisations never ceases to amaze me. <laughs> so this is a very good report. Um, as you say, you are slightly the gloomy spot at the end of the afternoon, but um, we do need to know what's happening, and it's good to know that you've got your finger on the pulse. So thank you very much for your report. Just echo the comments of colleagues. Um, Tessa, thanks for all your work, especially through the lockdown period. I know that you were highly valued in the work that you were doing in terms of the civil defence uh, work as well, and, and the thinking that you've been giving into the psychosocial aspect as well, which is important because it's the next phase of where we're heading. Um, I've reached out to you on a number of occasions and always impressed with your professionalism over that period, particularly um, with our older vulnerable people. And it was particularly mentioned to me when I reached this talking with Grey Power uh, in particular, who were very appreciative of, of yourself, Madeline, and, and the others in the team that were uh, making sure that people were connected with. Uh, and all our social service agencies have all done a fantastic job. And I, I guess look, we're all in a period of saying thank you because we really are very grateful to our staff for the leadership that you have provided through this time. We're very proud of you all. Um, you've done an outstanding job. To Grant, who's here too, um, we haven't speci specifically mentioned you because we haven't had a report, but Grant, you and your Green Space team, while we're acknowledging as well, um, pass on our thanks. There were some challenges over that period of time in our parks and reserves, particularly our skateboard parks, as we know, uh, and another, a, a number of other um, issues that came up through that time. So you all responded in a timely way, um, Simon, with particularly with our um, uh, community facilities as well. That's been a big challenge. But to, to all our staff, Chris, um, you and your team, we're really thankful and appreciative of all the work that's been done and will continue to be done. Thank you, Tessa. I just um, want to mention, I think that it's really good to see this, perhaps the silver lining that's come out of this is the collaboration between all the food banks and how they're now all talking and sharing. And so there's, the, again, you get that 
disaster brings some really good things out of it when people get together and actually um, support each other. I uh, just also want to congratulate you for all the work done on helping support fundraising for the groups and funding applications with all the new funds that are coming in. Um, I go to the SCSW meeting once a month. They're meeting monthly at the moment to try and support more, more often. Normally it's the second month. Um, the next meeting is on Monday, this coming Monday. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been very, very impressed with the range of agencies collaborating there. So again, thank you for pulling all the strands together. Anytime I get a welfare question, I don't know where to go. I go to Tessa. Nothing really more to add to that, except for I forgot to say, um, Nikki Carter is a rock star. Yeah. <laughs>